Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about things that matter at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum counselor and teacher, intuitive guide, author and podcaster, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This show is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical and esoteric concepts and ancient wisdom validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities and the humankind. My intention for this podcast is to be engaging, educational, empowering and fun, but it may also surprise or even shock you as we venture into deep rabbit holes and out on a limb as far as we can. Each conversation is different, each guest is unique, each episode is a story with profound wisdom you may want to listen to more than once. So sit back, relax and enjoy this episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. Before I introduce today's topic and my special guest, I'd like to give you a few important updates. This is the final episode in season 4. I like to move my podcast into a new season whenever I make some changes to it. The new season 5, which starts on July 26, will have a different format with shorter episodes my solo segment and a guest spot. Another big change is my brand new podcast website, which is now on a different, much more stable platform. It has a new attractive design, guest profiles, reviews and a blog, quick links to my guided meditations and my quantum programs, a sign up for my quantum talk newsletter and generally offers a much better experience for the visitors. So please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com And finally, I'd like to invite you to visit my main website, quantumliving.com.au, also recently redesigned, to find out about my unique quantum personal transformation programs based on science and spirituality, just like this podcast, such as healing emotional addictions and quantum shifts. And now, back to today's episode. We are living in challenging times. Our physical needs for food, water and shelter, not to mention good health, are coming to the fore in the increasingly unpredictable economy, climate change, political and social upheavals, the COVID pandemic and many other disruptive factors. Our enjoyment of life and freedom is being curtailed. We feel unstable like in the quicksand with nothing to hold on to, and our emotional needs for safety, security, love and connection are often being threatened. Well, with such doom and gloom, there is no hope, you might say. Depression sets in as we disconnect from life and keep going on automatic just to stop feeling the pain. We have forgotten that we have within us the key to change all that. This key opens the windows and lets the fresh air in and sunshine into the dark prison of our mind. All we need to do is to rediscover, reconnect and embrace the most powerful and most important part of our being, our spiritual self and its connection with the quantum field and the divine. You are never alone. You can always ask for help and can also learn how to change your life experience. Little children cherish their invisible friends who listen, understand and offer love and guidance. I will let you in on a little secret. Those invisible friends never go away. The beauty of the spiritual help we receive is that it doesn't make us reliant and dependent on it. Instead, it empowers us showing the way to ourselves. Two heads are better than one, 
so I have invited someone who is also an expert in this field to join me in this important conversation on my show today. My special guest is Jean Slater. Jean is a spiritual teacher, founder of the Creative Mystic Intuitive and the Higher Guidance Life Coach Certification Programs and author of the widely successful book Hiring the Heavens. Utilizing dowsing, oracles, and exploratory questioning, Jean specializes in going beyond intuition into a conversation with higher guidance. You will find Jean's full bio with more information and links to her online presence in the episode show notes at quantumlivingpodcast.com. And now, Jean joins me from California. Hello, Jean. Welcome to Quantum Living. It's a pleasure to have you on my show. Thank you, Anna. I am so excited to be here, and I can't wait to get into this conversation because I know it's going to be stellar. <laughs> yes, that's that's my feeling too. You know, whenever I research my guest's work in preparation for the interview, I usually get the title of the episode in my mind that captures the essence of the conversation pretty quickly. But with you, for some reason, I just couldn't put the finger on it for days. Finally, in desperation, <laughs> I asked my higher guidance for help. I said, please tell me what would be the best title for my interview with Jean. And immediately I heard the words I recognized as one of my poems, which was very strange to say the least. I used to write poems many years ago, <laughs> and this is in fact one of my favorites. So I quickly searched for it on my computer, and when I found it and when I read it, I thought, oh my gosh. This whole poem captures the essence of what I'd like to bring into and out of this podcast. So the title of this episode is Finding the Way to Myself. And I feel that my higher guidance wants me to read this poem to open the space. It's very short and no one has ever heard or read it before but me. So that it's virgin exposure, you could say. <laughs> it's titled Reflections. In the middle of nowhere, which is my destination, my thoughts are growing endlessly. Running against the wind, I'm finding their seeds here and there. I keep calling their names, but only Echo answers me, showing the way to myself. That is just beautiful and truly inspired. When I saw that that's what you wanted to title this conversation, I knew immediately that this was all being guided. And <laughs> so you are spot on. <laughs> Thank you. And it was so strange that the words that, that came to my mind, I immediately recognized as this poem. And then, in fact, I feel that the poem captures the essence the energy of what we will be talking about. So to start off, I'd like to ask you, Jean, have you found the way to yourself on your life's journey? And could you share your story with us? Well, first of all, I will tell you that one's journey takes a lifetime, right? <laughs> I mean, because it's never over till it's over. So, um, there was a time, though, that I wondered uh, uh, significantly about that, because for the first 20 years of my life, I grew up in a cult. And this was, I call it a cult because it had very strong mind control. It was the type of religion that we would have done whatever the minister told us to do, whether that would be to drink the Kool-Aid or to whatever. We would have done it because we were given what I think is a drug. We were told we were chosen. And people will do anything wow. to keep that status of being chosen. So um, when I was 20 and in a church college, I did something very outrageous. I began to question the church doctrine. And I began to think on my own for the first time in my life. And what I found was disturbing. And I found that 
the Bible verses that the church was quoting didn't have anything to do with what their doctrine was. It didn't make sense to me. And all of a sudden, everything began to crumble and fall apart. And the rug was literally pulled out from underneath me. Uh, my whole life shifted and changed in a matter of, of a couple months. I left the church then when I was actually 19 when I left the church. Um, but, you know, 19 to 20, that was a rough, rough year for me. I threw the baby out with the bathwater. From that point on, for the next 20 years, I didn't want anything to do with spirituality. I didn't want anything to do with God. Don't mention angels to me. If you believe in that sort of thing, you're nuts. <laughs> That's how I viewed it. I wanted nothing to do with it. So there I was for 20 more years in this place of denial that there was anything beyond what I could see with my eyes right in front of me. When I was in uh, my early 40s, I had a pivotal moment that changed everything. Actually, there was a moment before that that uh, was rather pivotal. I read the book Out on a Limb by Shirley MacLaine. Have you ever read it? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> that book was groundbreaking, and yeah. I am so appreciative of the courage that she had to write that book. Uh, there was a moment in the book where she and her spiritual teacher, Kevin Ryerson, were standing by the ocean in California, and he is encouraging her to shout to the ocean, I am God. <laughs> when I read that, I literally thought, I'm going to burn right now because I, that's blasphemy. <laughs> You can't say that. It would. It felt like that to me, even though I had left the church years prior and no longer believed in that. Just reading those words felt like I could be struck by lightning or something. So um, it was the first time, though, that I read anything that began to open my eyes to maybe there is something else. And maybe there was a way to look at things that didn't include a fixed dogma and doctrine that you had to adhere to. So um, that was the first part of that was 40 years of my life. And now here I am. What I teach about is angels. I'm a spiritual teacher. <laughs> I teach about angels. I do pendulum dowsing. I do oracle readings. I'm the least likely person that would have ever thought to be doing that. I never saw it coming, <laughs> never. And um, but my whole life changed um, in, in my 40s. So that's my journey and my way to finding myself. But I will tell you, Anna, because as I said, the journey lasts a lifetime. And I am still discovering more and more of who I am. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. And yes, I agree that the journey never ends. The point in the title of our conversation and, and what I said in my, in my poem is to find the way to myself. And yes, the journey never ends, but at least when we have identified the way to ourselves, that's, that's the key. So thank you. I'd like to open this topic from the highest perspective and then move down to the more specific issues and, and topics within it. What, in your view, are the biggest challenges facing us today in terms of our understanding of who we really are and our place in the universe? I love that question. Um, to address the point that you talked about, about finding the way to your true self, um, I will tell you that all roads 
in your life will lead to a greater understanding of who you are and how you create. And what I talk about is that light that you are, the God light that you are. When Shirley MacLaine was at the ocean and shouting, I am God, she was describing that divine self that she is truly. And all roads in your life will be to discover what that light is, what are the gifts of that light, what is the unique aspect of light that you bring to this earth, and then how do you express it? So all roads will lead to learning who you are and how you create. And the biggest challenge to prevent you from doing that is buying in to the fundamental delusion that the only reason you're here on this planet is to, and what I'm going to say here is like something that you've probably heard a hundred times, but I'm going to uh, say it in a new way. I disagree with the idea that the reason that we're here is to learn that Mm -hmm. the idea that this, this earth is a schoolroom. I disagree with that idea and here. I'll tell you why. (laughs) Because the fundamental delusion is, is that if you're here on this planet, it's not where you want to be. This is just a proving ground to get you to the next place, whether that is heaven, nirvana, enlightenment, wherever you are on this planet, it's because you're trying to fix yourself. You're trying to fix your karma. You're trying to, you know... Um, fix your emotions so that you can grow and evolve and learn and get to that next place, that next better place. And I've heard so many people say, this is my last lifetime year. I'm not, I'm not coming back. I hope I've evolved enough, enough and I'm not coming back. That is a fundamental delusion. You are here as <laughs> a creator on a mission from God. You are here as a creator, a creator of what? experience so that you can know the truth of that experience. So here's the difference. Here's the difference. And it's a nuance, but it's a very important one. All right. So when a scientist, just imagine a scientist running in, running an experiment, wants to know what happens when I mix one chemical with another chemical, they are doing it to understand the nature of those elements, right? Mm -hmm. And they are wondering what could be created from this. Is there a possible new invention I could create? Is there a possible new drug I could create? They're they're doing it to create. And out of their curiosity, they are experimenting. Now, in the process, do they learn a whole lot about those elements? Absolutely. Absolutely. They learn a whole lot about what happens when you combine these things or what happens when you're trying to make a light bulb or whatever. You know, you think about any of the inventions. You learn a whole lot. But the purpose of your life is not to learn. The purpose of your life is to create. And that is a very important, nuanced distinction. Yes, you will learn a ton. But the purpose of your existence is to create. So when we, when you ask what, what is the biggest impediment to our discovering ourselves, it's that we've fallen into this delusion, fundamental delusion, that we're not here as creators on purpose for a purpose, but rather that we are here because they're, we're flawed. We're born in sin. We have to fix our karma. There's something wrong with us. And we have to get to a better place. Do you see the difference? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Jean, thank you. (laughs) First of all, Out on a Limb by Shirley MacLaine happens to be also the first book that introduced me into this field. And I will forever cherish that book. and And I'm amazed with her courage to talk about those issues. And as we know, obviously, the the book was hidden in the basement for a number of years for those reasons. But thank you. What you have just said about we are not here to learn, we are here to create, is exactly what I am sensing. 
And yes, I've been talking in my own programs and on other podcast recordings and in my work with, with clients. I have been talking and I'm still talking about learning and growing, but especially recently, I mean, you know, in the last maybe couple of years, when I've been saying and talking about those concepts from this perspective, I've been sensing an increasing almost resistance. And and then, you know, as I was doing my own research and you know, my, my own meditation, my own contact with with my higher guidance and, and the spirit, which I do, it became more and more clear to me what you have just said. We are here to co-create. So I started in- incorporating this in my own work. But the way you have explained this is absolutely magnificent because it doesn't dismiss or negate the fact that, yes, we are here to learn because we are learning, but it puts it in a different perspective. It is not the objective. It is the almost a, a, as a side effect. Uh, yes. As a side effect. And, and as you were speaking... What I kept thinking, this is, we are talking about the alchemy of life. So the earth is not the school per se. It is a playground for us to try and test and uh, look at different ways to see what we can create and how we can create. And I'm sure that you will agree with me that the key challenge in the sea of all the challenges, you know, and we could be talking, you know, whole day about how many, you know, what they are. The key and underlying is to understand and grasp in our mind that we are co-creators of our reality and everything stems from this. And I really want to make this other point, which was my next question, but there's such a such a lovely segue to it. And then I will open the space for you because I can sense that we are absolutely on the same page. I've got a, on my computer, I've got a desktop PC with two large monitors. I've got this amazing aquarium screensaver, which I run on both monitors, which is so realistic. So I can add a different fish. I can select different background. I can change the light, the bubbles, the sound. And often when I look at it. I keep thinking, are we living in a cosmic computer program where the software is our soul, the operating system is the supreme intelligence we call God, and any attempts to change our life, which is the program, and we can, once one program ends, or we get tired of it, we move to another program, meaning another lifetime. So are any attempts to change our life in a profound way is like hacking into the program. Over to you. You know, I think that you must have been reading my mind because I did a little meditation ahead of our conversation, and I was going to talk about that. So you picked right up on it. We are connected. (laughs) (laughs) Um, you know, okay. I would say as above, so below and everything that we see that is going on in our life here, there are examples that we can, that they already exist in the cosmic world. (laughs) So when I asked questions about this existence and how did we get here and what is my soul and all of those big questions. Of course, um, I am only going to be able to give a little snippet here of all the information that came forth from for the next three years of asking those questions. It's very complex. And of course, it would be because we are so interesting. But let me put it this way. My guidance told me that there are innumerable gods, innumerable gods. And our God is just the one God that has program earth. (laughs) Okay. So um, this particular program involves a nature program. 
And this nature program runs by itself. It's kind of like the framework within which, uh, let's just say that it's a video game. And then I, as uh, I'm going to put my avatar into the video game and walk around and play around. So there's the nature program that gives us the structure through which then um, I have to operate <laughs> and I have to move around. Yeah. But is there a possibility that I can get in there and hack the program? Or could I possibly, you know, even get a job in the department that's upgrading the program, <laughs> you know, and adding an update to the program <laughs> and my you know, putting in my own little thing, or maybe I can create a brand new creature or, well, you know, whatever. But yes, there's all of that. And so um, even that word, co-creator. I'm I'm just going to push a little bit on that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please do. So our God, which has this program, Program Earth, and, is, and it's the only one we're really aware of, but as we already know, science is telling us there's, there's all these other dimensions. What if there's these other dimensions are now governed by another <laughs> God? <laughs> okay, so... Um, um, what a soul is, and I'm going to give a definition of a soul that my guidance gave to me, a soul is an individuated aspect of God. And so here is God creating this mm, structure of, of the earth program, and then wants to live in it and move around in it and explore it. And the minute that God has an I wonder thought, just think of this. I wonder what it's like to that thought from God now gives birth to innumerable souls to go explore that, to go explore that from every end of the spectrum. So I'm going to give you a different definition of karma than perhaps you've ever heard before. So many people think of karma as, you know, you did something in one lifetime where you were, you know, rich and, and abused the plebes. And now in this lifetime, you're going to be one of the plebes and get abused by the rich or something along that line. And it's kind of like an idea of payback. Um, my definition from my guidance of karma is just a continuation of the exploration of that I wonder thought. Yeah. I wonder what it's like to have power. <laughs> and so I'm going to explore it from this side of the spectrum. And then I'm going to continue to explore it from the other side of the, the spectrum. Because I'm a creator, a creator of what? Experience. Why? So I can know the truth of that experience. So I want that experience of having power. I want to know it from every perspective and every end of the uh every possible incarnation of that so rather than it being karma and payback it's just continuation of the exploration I'm loving it. I'm loving it. And I find it so amazing. We must be tapping into the same spot in the quantum field. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you why. When you were talking about there is a number of gods, not just one. In my, um, in my coaching program, I have a little technique that I take my clients through. And it's called what if I have it, you know, I have written about 50 or so questions and I read those questions while they are in a deeply relaxed state. They not answer them, you know, out loud, but I'm just putting those questions into their mind, if you like. And some of those questions that I wrote are, what if our God is in the school for gods? What if our life is a petri dish as an experiment in the school of gods for this god? What if our god has a god or gods above? So I am exploring this concept in questions, what if? And the purpose is to expand the thinking, break the barriers 
of possibilities beyond what anyone could have ever thought about. So this comes from that concept and that thought that you have just been speaking to, because that's exactly what I am sensing. And it does take courage, even in our line of work, it does take courage to to speak about this so openly. If you are breaking the paradigm, the current narrative, most people would want to condemn you, you know, to hell. But what if we could invite people to simply, just for the moment, leave your knowledge and your beliefs aside and open up your mind to such a possibility. So thank you. I can't thank you enough for saying this because not only it validates the information that I've been getting, but it makes so much sense and it is an invitation for people to just look at it as a possibility and notice how it feels. Notice whether it empowers you or disempowers you. Beautiful. That is a great way to put it and to pay attention to. And one of the um, experiences that I had that really brought this to my forefront was um, there was a meditation that I used to do commonly where I would imagine uh, bringing in a beautiful violet light from the heavens and then bringing up a beautiful green light from the earth and having it co-mingle within my body and then move out and burst out into the planet. And I had been doing that meditation for quite some time and it was easy. One day, as I'm ready to do this meditation, I'm outside in my usual place and, and getting focused, but nothing is happening, Anna, nothing. I can't see a beautiful violet light. I can't see a beautiful green light. I can't feel anything. I'm getting nothing. It was just like a blank TV, (laughs) nothing at all. And so now I'm trying, I'm getting frustrated. And so I'm like trying to force it to happen. And again, it's the blank screen on a TV. There's nothing there. So I'm, I finally in frustration, say, guidance, what's going on? What is this? And they chuckled, they laughed, and they said, well, my dear, there is no such thing as light and energy. And I said, oh, you're wrong about that. (laughs) (laughs) Everything is light and energy. (laughs) Everything is. And they said, no, light and energy is an illusion. And I said, what? How, how could it possibly be an illusion? And then what they explained to me is they said, well, just imagine you're dreaming. When you're dreaming and in this dream, you're had, at a party and you're eating some of the food there and you're talking to your friends. Is there really the energy of the food in your dream? Is there really the light of your friends in your dream? Or is it just an illusion? And I said, okay, okay, I can kind of accept this. Um, Well, if there is no such thing as light and energy, is there anything that's real? And they said, yes, one thing, experience. Experience is the only thing that's real. And think about it. When we leave this planet, what is the only thing we take with us? the wisdom, the evolution, the growth that we have gained through our experiences. It is the only thing that we take with us. So when I said I was going to push a little on this idea of being a co-creator, we're here as creators. Creators of what? Experience. To know the truth of that experience. So when God has an I wonder thought, we're here to create the experience, to evolve God. Now, here's another thing that going to blow the mind here. God is evolving because we're evolving. So as, and God knows everything because at this moment in time, that's where we are, (laughs) you know, but every experience we have evolves God. Yes. You know, Shirley McLean would be so proud of us because we are going so far out on a limb. Like I have You know, I'm very brave, but I have never gone so far on a limb 
in any of my podcasts and conversations as what we are doing now. So thank you again. And and I love I love bringing topics and issues and ideas that stimulate people's minds and open their minds and stop them in their automatic thinking. Say, hang on a second. Think about this. Open your mind to the possibility of that. So I'm loving it. I'm so loving this. <laughs> <laughs> this conversation. Wow. Okay. So let's stay at this level. One of the key challenges, not just for now, but generally of living in the third dimension as human being that I can think of, and I can see it every day in my work with people, is the paradox of the so-called consensus reality not really being so much agreed upon or accepted by everyone because of our individual filters, our experiences, beliefs, values, preferences, attitudes, personalities, you name it, through which we process the information we receive through our five senses. So I'm not even getting to the sixth sense. Now, what is acceptable to you may not be acceptable to me in my life, what I like, you might dislike. What I perceive as white, you might see as gray, etc. But my question about this paradox and how we can deal with it is at two levels. Physical, in our human communication, and also spiritual. When we receive and exchange information with the spirit, so that's when we get into the sixth, uh, sixth sense, or higher guidance, the quantum field, etc. So in a nutshell, is everything that we experience and every information that we receive and send open to interpretation at those two levels? Could you please speak to this? So I, um, I'm not quite certain of your definition of consensus reality. So first of all, would you mind explaining what you mean by that? Okay, things around us that we agree are the same. For example, when I see a house and a car and you are standing next to me, you say, yes, I can see a house and a car. If you see, no, I can see an elephant and giraffe. Clearly, we are not looking at the same thing or our reality is not consensus because we are seeing different things. And we can't operate in the reality when we need to interact with each other, obviously. If I am seeing a city and you are seeing a jungle, it's, it just won't work. So this is an extreme example of what I mean by consensus reality. And then we, you know, we, we take it down to, to the nuance level where because of different filters that we have in our communication, we hear what we want to hear and we see what we want to see, not necessarily what the other person hears and, and sees. So what I'm talking about is how can we, or can we find a common ground so that when I am seeing a city and going through the city, you are not seeing a jungle because if that's the case, we are not in the same dimension. So Anna, um, I, I think there is a, a, a even broader question that if we go back to the idea that, uh, let's use the example, although it's limited, um, but let's use the example that our God has created a video game and this video game is called The Earth Project. And, and in this uh, video game, um, the structure has been created for us. And a chair is a chair. And, and when you sit down in the chair, you can expect to find that there's a seat that's going to hold you. <laughs> you know? Hopefully. That you're not going to fall <laughs> through it and, and fall to yeah. the floor. Uh, and or that if you uh, step into water, that you're going to be able to feel the sand underneath the water, you know, so there there's that consensus. And I believe that is built into the program Earth of what that looks like. Now, are there always people that will play with that consensus? Are there always people that will play with that structure? Absolutely. And that 
has to do with the soul's mission. You know, what was the I wonder thought through which that soul was born? So we're not all here to do that. Um, I'll give you an example. I was at a conference and the speakers were uh, given a back room where we had lunch every day. And uh, it was a long rectangular table and food was passed from one end of the table around the other end of the table. And each day as this food was passed around, there was a gentleman there that took nothing on his plate and just continued to pass each bowl by and his plate was completely empty. And I thought on the first day, he just must not be hungry. But when dessert came around, he filled it to the top. <laughs> I mean, it was overflowing. You should have seen, he could barely fit the whipped cream on top of everything. And he hungrily ate all the dessert. I thought, well, that was just a particular day. The next day, the same thing happened. And on the third day, when the same thing happened, I couldn't stand it anymore. And I said, like, like, what is it? You don't eat? And he looked up at me, surprised by the question almost. And he said, oh, you mean like food? No, I haven't eaten food in 40 years. And I said, what? And he says, oh, I like dessert. So that's what I eat. And this man was the epitome of health. And he said he'd been checked out by all sorts of doctors and naturopaths. Nobody could believe it. And I said to him, how is that possible that you have not eaten anything but desserts and candy bars? He, I call him the Kit Kat man because his whole suitcase was packed with Kit Kats. And, and so I said, how is it possible that you've only eaten dessert for 40 years? And he said, well, I got it when I was very young, that all is God. And that was his answer. All is God. So then he said, so I like dessert. So I eat dessert. Well, is it everyone's path to just eat dessert and defy that yeah. structural consensus of what it, what a balanced meal looks like? The answer is no. And I would be so bored just eating desserts. <laughs> I love different scenes. And so I don't want that. I have no desire to create that in my life or to experiment with that. But that's what he came in to show us and to experiment with and to show a possibility. But everybody is here on a different I wonder thought. And so we're all here exploring different ideas, different experiences and we are giving back and evolving God in that way. So going back to what I said before, the fundamental delusion is, is that if somehow you're here on earth, it's only because you got to fix yourself to get to a better place and evolve enough so that you can finally never come back again. That is all wrong. We are here on purpose for the purpose of creating and to really, really own that. You are a creator and there's no other place you want to be. Thank you for sharing a ma an amazing story. And this reminds me, uh, that was, I think, a couple of years ago in Australia, there was a man who was uh, quite heavy. He was, in fact, quite obese. And he tried all sorts of diets, all sorts of things. Nothing worked for him. And then he decided, and I don't remember that part, how this idea came to him, whether someone recommended or it was his own insight. Anyway, he decided one day, that he was going to eat nothing but potatoes, nothing else, <laughs> cooked or baked, so mashed potatoes, boiled potatoes. He lived on potatoes alone, plus obviously water, for 12 months. He's lost something like 50 kilos or, you know, huge amount, so, so he became slim. In that time, he was being checked and monitored by doctors, you know, he, he had the blood test and he didn't lack any minerals or any vitamins or nothing. He's lost all the weight that, that he needed to lose, eating nothing but potatoes. So 
that was in his mind and similar situation. He was in perfect health. He didn't lack any nutrients. He's lost all the way that he needed to, to lose. And so the concept is the same. This is all in our mind. And if we accept the concept that, as he put it, all is God and what we choose to experience as an expression of God to get this particular experience, it's for us to choose. Now, would this work necessarily for other people? And I didn't follow up the story, by the way, so I don't know. We don't know. But if someone else decided to do the same thing, and perhaps their uh, belief system, or that they believe that, yes, this, is, this will work, was not strong enough because they were not 100% convinced it may not have worked for someone else. Would you agree? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> and okay. I, okay. I mean, I love what you're saying, but I just, I, you know, because I felt, I, I thought all those things too. But my guidance has a way of arguing with me. <laughs> my guidance has a way of, of saying, no, that, that that whole idea that you had where you said, what if? But I'll tell you what, my guidance does that to me all the time. And says, let's just look at this another way. So what my guidance has said is that each and every one of us has been given, let's say, your, do you play cards? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you've been given your hand to play. Yeah. You could never be given a full deck. Can you imagine sitting down at a poker table and everybody's given the full deck? <laughs> I mean, that wouldn't be a game, would it? It wouldn't be any fun. Yeah. So instead, you're given a limited number of cards, and it depends on your skill to play your game. So each and every one of us comes to this incarnation, not with a full deck, <laughs> where we are a empowered, omnipotent God. We are not. We have a limited number of cards that we get to play, and it's a surprise to us every time we incarnate. And it takes skill to play the life game. It takes skill. And I will tell you that it wouldn't matter if there were, you know, uh, somebody believes strong enough in something like, like, uh, like say myself, that I believed that I could live on Kit Kats for 40 years. It wouldn't matter how strongly I believed in that. I don't have that card in my deck. Now, another example would be to say, um, you know, like, like you hear it all the time. You can be anything you want to be. Uh, that's not true. It depends on the cards that you have in your deck. I can tell you, I will never be a Beethoven ever. I don't have that card and it wouldn't matter how much I practice. I will still never, ever be a Beethoven. And so when I said all roads lead to understanding who you are, discovering what are the cards that you have, what are your divine gifts that you have, and now how do you express that in the world? That's what we're here to do. And each incarnation is a surprise to us. And that's what makes it so fun and interesting. And it's why we keep wanting to play. Reincarnation after incarnation is because it's always new and exciting. It's always different. We never know what we're going to get. Thank you. Oh, I'm loving this metaphor. I'm absolutely loving it. And this would explain why, for example, not every weight loss program, not every healing modality, not every even medication works for everyone, every person in the same way. It works for some, doesn't work for others. So, it doesn't come down to their genetics, their physical body, etc. But as you said, whether this is the card that they can play or not. I'm loving it. Oh my goodness. Where do we go from here? <laughs> Beautiful. So Jean, let's now talk about how we can work with the spirit through various divination tools, and I understand that you uh, teach how to work with pendulum, and you also work with oracle cards. So how can we work with the spirit and who is out there <laughs> that is happy to, to help us and work with us, to give us help from beyond the veil, if you like, 
So could you talk to this for a moment? Yeah. Um, so when we get into things like uh, divination tools, dowsing, oracle readings, and that sort of thing, um, for some people, it is intimidating. And they feel that uh, this is not something that you're either born with that ability uh, or it's like being an intuitive. You either are born with it or you have a near death experience. And oh, my gosh, now I'm intuitive. I never knew it before. <laughs> you know, it's that sort of thing. I'm talking to angels. Who knew? <laughs> but um, but that was not the case for me. I was very left brain. And I used to install mainframe computers. That's how left brained I was. And if you recall, because of my upbringing for 40 years, the idea of using a pendulum or oracles was like dabbling in um, the in devil stuff, you know, so I would never have done that. And there, I remember it, uh, where I used to work, there was a lady there that read tarot cards and I wouldn't even walk down the hallway where she worked because <laughs> I didn't want to, you know, like, I was afraid of that. <laughs> Devil energy. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. That's, that's, you know, witchy stuff. But what I found is that left brainers are extremely good at intuition. And here's why. It's a muscle that you have to train. But if you can strengthen that muscle, you're a whole brain thinker. And so you can receive intuitive information from the, say, the right brain, and then the left brain does all the analysis and analyzes the question and says, well, what about this? And let's check this nuance. And there, you know, the left brain is really good at at asking the right question. And the answers that you receive are really about how good is your question and how well are you interpreting what the response is? Because I'll tell you that there are so many people that begin to do something like uh, dowsing or reading a tarot card. And let's say for an example, they pull the death card in the tarot. And, and I literally had this happen in a class that I was teaching. She uh, pulled the death card and it freaked her out so much. She just stood up and left the class and went off. And I heard later, she was just bawling in her car. I had no idea that it happened. Here's the problem is they don't understand that there's an interpretation for every card. And if you know how to ask good questions and ask questions about how your what your perspective is you know I'm looking at it this way can you tell me higher guidance is that what you're trying to tell me is am I looking at it the way that you want me to see it and and the problem with a lot of intuitives is they just receive the information and don't question it so what I'm saying is is if you are a left brainer take heart you can be an excellent intuitive if you can train the the intuitive side to receive the information, you've got the best of both worlds. Okay, thank you. So I have a particular question about dowsing or working with a pendulum. Is it possible for a negative energy of whatever sort to be attached to the pendulum or, or participate in the process? and give you false answers and the wrong information. So if we take interpretation out of the equation, is there anything else, any other forces, if you like, involved in that process that could be negative, some malicious entities or whatever? Is it possible? Excellent. Excellent question. And yes. And so here's a couple suggestions. Um, one, um, the American Society of Dowsers puts out an ebook that's free. Uh, anybody can go and download it. And it's called Letter to Robin. And in that booklet is a how to douse and gives you a whole program to safely set it up to where when you are receiving answers, you are only receiving answers straight from your highest guidance and that nothing else can interfere. So I would recommend that. Second thing I will tell you is that guidance doesn't like 
certainly to be tested. And now here's what I mean by that. You know, let's set up a test. <laughs> let's set up a test and see if we can douse and uh, use a pendulum and 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 guess which door leads to what room or whatever, you know, that sort of thing. Guidance doesn't like to be tested. And that is just something that I have observed. That's one thing. But second of all, it's like guidance is here. Your guidance, our angels, your guide, your higher self, it's here for you about your journey. There's so much more important things. You know, it's like your higher guidance is going, oh, what? Now we're going to do a test here. What's really important is the journey that you're on in discovering who you are and how you express your light. That's what we want to talk about. Let's get on to that because that's much more important to us. And so what happens is that um, your guidance will, especially if you try to force it to answer a question that it doesn't want to answer, you're going to get garbage. So this is one of the things that I teach my uh, in my course for higher guidance life coaching, which is a type of life coaching where you tap into someone's higher guidance and let their higher guidance be their co coach. And I tell them, take always let higher guidance take the lead. Don't force higher guidance to answer a question it doesn't want to answer because you're just going to get garbage. Now, here's an example. Let's say the person has an issue with... Um, wait, they want to lose 10 pounds. And this is like, this is why they paid all the money is because they want to have a session because they want to lose that 10 pounds. And they you tap into their higher guidance and their higher guidance goes, oh my dear, this is not important. We want to talk to you about this journey you're on with your relationship and how that is affecting your life. And we want to talk to you about what it is that you are exploring and how you're growing and you're going to miss the boat if you don't blah, blah, blah. You know, this is what higher guidance wants to talk about. And they don't want to talk about that 10 pounds, right? So if you force higher guidance to say, she wants to lose 10 pounds, which diet should she be on? here's three different diets, which one should she be on? You're just going to get garbage answers. That's why that's why that left brain comes in and can analyze and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute here. I'm forcing guidance to give an answer to something it doesn't even want to give an answer to. Let me ask guidance what question it would like me to ask. And I'll tell you, I've had that happen so many times when I'm working with a client where uh, we think we're going to be talking about one thing, but guidance takes us off in a completely different direction. But I will promise you this. And at the end of the conversation, the client always says, that is exactly what I needed to know. I didn't even know I needed to know it, but I am so grateful for that information. It's exactly what I needed. <laughs> Yes, and I absolutely thank you for that. I absolutely agree with you and and I and I hear what you're saying. But does it mean that we can't get answers like straight answers to smaller questions about, you know, in the scheme of things of our whole life, perhaps less significant, but nonetheless which are important to us for a number of reasons. Does it mean that if our higher guidance decides, oh, no, no, this is not, not, not really important, that we cannot get those answers? No, and I, I'm so glad you're asking that because here's, here. let me tell you the difference. One is me saying, this person wants to lose 10 pounds, which diet should she go on? That's one, one approach. That's leading higher guidance. The second way to do it is, can we talk about the weight loss for the 10 pounds? Now I'm letting higher guys say, yes, we can talk about that. All right. Since we can talk about it, are there some diet plans that would be helpful? Yes. Do I have 
a diet plan written down here that might be helpful for her. You know, so so I'm asking, I'm always asking higher guidance, do you have an opinion about this? Is there something you care to share? Am I on the right track? You know, I'm letting higher guidance tell me that, yes, it has an opinion. Otherwise, if I'm forcing it, saying you have to answer this question, no, that doesn't work. <laughs> okay, so the difference is, about how you ask the question and how you formulate the question. Okay. Yeah. yeah, because like I always tell people the number one question you want to ask higher guidance is, do you have an opinion about this? Because like, say for an example, I'm house hunting and I'm looking at three different homes that I'd like to buy. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask guidance, um, which home should I buy? Now, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is guidance, do you have an opinion about which home would be best for me? Because if guidance doesn't have an opinion, then it's up to me. <laughs> okay, so what I'm hearing is that uh, if your question is about a choice, which of the available options or in whatever area would be the best one for me, if your decision is important in terms of choosing one over another, then the guidance will help you. If the choice is in a category, well, whichever, whatever you choose will be fine. Whatever. Yeah. Guidance will often come okay. back and just say, what do you want? <laughs> yeah. What, yeah. Okay. I get it. I get it. Again, you know, we are getting into a, we are speaking at, as I would call a high level nuance. Yes. But that's the nuances are so important because often where people will pick up a pendulum, they get a wrong, an obvious wrong answer, and they say, forget it. I'm not going to do this anymore. It doesn't work. <laughs> you know, and that's, I, I you know, you know I, I'm, the, dowsing is such an incredible art. It is so worth taking the time to learn it. But there are these nuances that will help you get accurate answers. <laughs> okay. So this is, in a sense, a nice, another nice segue to my next question about negative entity and negative energy attachments. I know, and I'm sure you do, and some people may know, that this is, a, while a difficult and complex topic to talk about, this is actually quite common. So without going into the depth of the issue itself, could you speak to this within the concept of the universal law of sovereignty, which says that there's one consciousness in one physical body in this 3D dimension? So how can this happen to begin with? Again, is this because it is we have it in our cards that we've been dealt, or is it something different? And also, I watched your interview with Regina Meredith on Gaia not long ago, where you talk about a similar issue. And you shared a little technique with a little prayer that you found in a particular book, and you shared it in the interview, which I feel might help many people. So without judgment, without and. I guess there would be some people who will ridicule it and that's okay. So just leave it out of, you know, from this conversation, don't pay any attention. But I, I strongly feel that uh, there is something really important in it that many people would benefit. So how negative entity attachments, energy attachments can happen to begin with? How can we allow this to happen? And if you could again share with us this particular little, very peculiar and bizarre technique, and perhaps if you are aware of any others. Sure. Um, how it happens is often through some sort of trauma is one way. Uh, trauma, um, um, anything that causes us to lose um, our, I, I want to say our, not our consciousness, but if you're at a bar and you are an alcoholic and you are not in your right mind, <laughs> you're not in control, you're a prime suspect. You There are lots of entities hanging around bars waiting for someone that is not in control of their space and where they can get in. You're just vulnerable. The same thing if you are drugged out. 
You are hooked on heroin. You're a prime suspect. You're a prime, you are a prime, you're vulnerable to entities attaching themselves. So a little bit of caution there. If you, it's not to say that you can't go out and have a night and just get, you know, blitzed if that's what you want to do. But check afterwards to make sure you didn't bring home any hitchhikers. And one of the ways that you can check to see if you brought home hitchhikers is by checking your little fingers. Now, this is a technique that when I first read it, I thought, this can't be real. But I Mm. have been working with this for over 20 years, and it's absolutely real. It absolutely is amazing. And I've seen it happen not only in my own personal family, but with so many of my clients and just have heard story after story of the miracle that happens afterwards. So the way that you check to see if you have any hitchhikers is by taking your palms and having them face you, you know, straight up towards your face, and then put the edges of your palms together where the little fingers are touching each other, you know, side by side. What you're going to do is you're going to first line up the heart line. The heart line is a uh, about three quarters of an inch below the little finger. So on the palm, line up the heart line. And once you get that straight across, then look at your little fingers and make sure they're even across at the top. If they are not, if they are a little bit off, doesn't matter which hand they're off on, if they're a little bit off, you've got a hitchhiker. And sometimes these hitchhikers are benign, then you hardly even notice them. And some of them are really malevolent. And so um, you want you don't want them in your energy field. So there's a simple little prayer. And all you do is just close your eyes, take a nice deep breath and say, from the divine love that flows through me, whatever is in my auric field with or without my permission, I now ask that it go to the core of its being, go with light and love. So be it. Amen. Simple little prayer, and then recheck your fingers, and that quick, they'll be even. It's mind-blowing. I had, a, I'll just tell you a story of how uh, incredible this is. One of my students channels and has channeled for years. And when she was in the program, she, uh, it was the part of the program where we talked about this prayer. She said the prayer and then she heard the familiar voice that would come through when she would channel. And they said to her in a very sad voice, they said, do you really want us to leave? (laughs) (laughs) And then she realized, she said, no, no, you can stay. So this was a case where these beings had been with her and had she had channeled them for years and they were how she, uh, they had made her life so rich for her this was a working relationship uh-huh. but that's just how powerful that prayer is they were going to leave at the you know if she yeah. would have said yes you have to go they would have left yes and i have myself seen exactly how quickly that worked with someone who knew they had an entity attachment. Now, there is no physical explanation for a little finger to grow by half a centimeter within a minute. I mean, it just can't happen. And yet, that's what happened. And afterwards, they were able to to confirm because various symptoms of that entity attachments were gone, that that's what happened. So I have witnessed it myself. Are you able to tell us which book this came from? Okay, it's called Awaken to the Healer Within by Rich Work, just W-O-R-K, with Anna Marie Groth, Mm G-R-O-T-H. Okay, thank you. So, yes, thank you. I feel that this will be of benefit to many people listening to this podcast and wanting to try this technique with the prayer. Thank you. Okay, Jean, now let's talk about can we really hire 
the heaven. Obviously, I'm referring to your fabulous book, Hiring the Heaven, in which you talk about working with angels. And I mean, it's it's a wonderful, wonderful, very popular book. Could you please talk a bit about this book and how can we hire the heaven <laughs> and then move on to your other work, your, your courses, your programs, your offerings? I mentioned that when I was in my early 40s, I had a pivotal moment that changed my life and forced me to admit that there was something beyond which that which I could see, that there was something <laughs> in the unseen world assisting me. And I will tell you what that was. At the time, I was working as a naturopath, and um, I had studied nutrition, and I had a wonderful computer that would measure the energy in the acupuncture points, and I loved it because it was a computer. I, I was very left brain, so this was great. A computer is on and off bites and bits of information. So I understood that. And that's how I related. And as I worked with my clients, I wanted to stay just with, you have this illness, let's use this uh, herb or this technique. Uh, very, uh, you know, not nothing out of the box, just, uh, just kind of straight naturopathy. But one of the things that I had learned that was out of the box is I had learned to douse. And that's why I encourage people to try pendulum dowsing because it opens that door to intuition like nothing else I know of. It And because pendulum dowsing is so dependent on questions, on accurate questions. So what that does is really open the door to intuition. Well, one day as I'm working with a client, I, uh, through dowsing, asked, what is it that is the appropriate technique to do for this particular client? And it was a clearing for five neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are the chemicals that the brain produces, like nor uh, norepinephrine and dopamine and serotonin and that sort of thing. And not only did I need to clear five neurotransmitters, but I needed to name them all. I came up with four of them and could not think of what that fifth neurotransmitter is. And so I said to my client, I'm so sorry, we're going to have to reschedule because your body keeps telling me I need to name all five. I've only come up with four. Let's reschedule. That'll give me some time to do some research on neurotransmitters. Then the first words out of her mouth was, is histamine a neurotransmitter? And I looked at her rather oddly because this was a lay person. I didn't even know that she would know the word histamine. I said, no, histamine is that stuff your sinuses produce when you have an allergic reaction. That's why you take an antihistamine. But no, it's not a neurotransmitter. Then in the next nanosecond, for whatever reason, I reach around and I pull a book off my shelf that I had purchased one year before and had never opened. It falls open to the word histamine in the title. And I laughed and I said, look, it's talking about histamine. How crazy is that? Then in the next nanosecond, it's as if something took my eyeballs and pointed them to a line buried in the paragraph that said, quote, histamine is also thought to be a neurotransmitter. That was the moment when the hair stood up on the back of my neck and on my arms, and I realized something, something extraordinary just happened, that something had guided that whole interaction. When I said I need to reschedule, something made my client ask, is, neuro, is histamine a neurotransmitter? <laughs> and when I said no, something made me turn around pull that book off the shelf, something opened the book, something took my eyes to that one line. It's the only line I read in the whole page. I frankly, Anna, I could not wait to finish with my client and get her out the door because I was so freaked out. Let's go back <laughs> to my early 40s when I was not in, I did not want to talk about anything beyond what I could see and an herb and nutrition. I didn't want to talk about anything else. But that experience told me there is something beyond. 
there is something that is undeniable and you can't see it, but it's there and it's guiding you and it's helping you. So I thought to myself, well, maybe I have a spiritual physician helping me, some cosmic physician that's guiding me with my clients. Every day after that, I began to call (laughs) upon this spiritual physician to help me with my clients. I would say, look, here's who we have coming into the office today. Can you help me with so-and-so who has blood pressure issues and help me with so-and-so who has diabetes? And information would come through that I couldn't possibly know from my spiritual physician. But it didn't stop there. I thought to myself, well, if I have this spiritual physician and they're helping me with my clients, like I need help with other aspects of my work. I need a spiritual receptionist and a spiritual time manager and a spiritual money manager and a spiritual marketer. I need all of that to assist me in my work. Uh, What if I hire those beings, those specialties to go to work for me? So every day in the car, when I would go to my office, I would have a staff meeting and call (laughs) upon my entire staff (laughs) and tell them what I needed. I'll cut to the chase. For the next 10 years, I was able to work and support my entire family while my husband stayed at home with our four kids. And I did that all without hiring anybody because it was all taken care of for me on the spiritual level. But it doesn't stop there, Anna. (laughs) Wait, there is more. (laughs) Wait, there's more. Because I thought initially that the only reason it was happening is because I was doing a good thing, helping people Mm -hmm. in my office. But one day I thought, I wonder if I could ask just for myself, just for something that is purely selfish. Like I want to go clothes shopping. I wonder if I could hire a spiritual wardrobe consultant to go with me and help me find the best outfits, the ones that I just love, and for the best price. And that day, I bought 13 outfits for just over $200. (laughs) It was something crazy. Well, there's more. So I began to hire from the heavens for everything in my life. Didn't matter if it was for uh, like when we'd go on a vacation. I'd hire a spiritual connoisseur to help us find the best restaurants on our trip. I'd hire a spiritual mechanic to make sure the car ran smoothly. I'd hire a spiritual attitude adjuster to keep my kids happy in the car. I'd hire a spiritual tour guide to make sure that we stopped at all the places um, along the way that we would love to see. I can tell you miracle after miracle that has happened this I honestly we need a couple hours to go through all the miracles that have happened from hiring the heavens. I will tell you this one just because it's my favorite, and um, it comes from one of my uh, a, a, someone who had come to listen to me speak on hiring the heavens, and she was a widow. She'd been her husband had died ten years prior, and. She heard about how you can hire the heavens for anything. And in my talk, I talked about a spiritual jewelry sleuth that will help you find lost jewelry. And truly, there's none better in the universe. They bring back jewelry that's been missing forever. Well, her wedding band had been missing for 10 years. On the way driving home from the talk that I gave, she called upon the spiritual jewelry sleuth. And she said, you know, I'd really love to have my wedding band back. Could you find it for me and bring it to me? When she got home, she sat down on her couch and she put her feet up on the coffee table. Now on the coffee table is a live plant that she had bought a couple of years prior. She noticed that something shiny was in the soil. She reached over and pulled out her wedding band that had been missing for 10 years. Anna, I have story after story after story about missing items that just reappear 
after years. It reappeared because if she bought that plant only a couple of yes. years earlier, it must have just reappeared yes. from wherever it was before. Oh my gosh, there was an, a review on Amazon that was just amazing. This lady said when she read the book, she wanted to hire the spiritual jewelry sleuth because her mother had died three years prior and the mother had an opal ring that had always been promised to her. But when she died, they looked through the entire house and they never found it ever. So after reading the book, she said, spiritual jewelry sleuth, could you find that my mother's opal ring and bring it to me? The next day she's doing her laundry and she's mating socks out of the dryer. One of the socks has a knot in it. She unties the knot. She kind of feels there's something in it. She reaches her hand in the sock and pulls out her mother's opal ring. <laughs> you have goosebumps yet? Oh, my <laughs> goodness. So the process is as simple as can I hire and name the specialty or specialization? Could you help me with this and the other? It is as simple as that. Yes. Yes, it really is. And, uh, you know, if you do nothing more than just that, you're already going to have miracles. And if you want to know more, read the book. I mean, it's just angels are there to help you with every aspect of your life, because remember who you are. You are a God self and you are here as a creator. Now, do you think that God just puts you here with no help at all? You have the entire universe of cosmic help to assist you in your creation. They're all here for you. Wow. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Thank you. I definitely would love to have you back on my show because time is catching up with us and you know we have barely scratched the surface. So I love to have you again on my show. But before we close, oh in fact, I have a, just one more question about hiring the heavens or the heaven or maybe there is multiple heavens. I don't know. <laughs> Do they want to get paid or is it free? <laughs> yes, they do want to get paid. Oh, how do you pay them? There's two ways. One, through your joy. Because mm -hmm. that's what they're here to do is your love and your joy. But the most important way they get paid is through presence. When you are present, so you are here to be a creator of experience. That's your job. Now be about that and be consciously involved in your creation. So what I mean by that is um, if you're a, a drug addict and, you're ch and you've checked out, you're not present. Wow. Okay. So could you please... Tell us about your courses, your programs and offerings, just briefly. And I will obviously include all the links in the show notes so people will be, will be able to find you and, and connect with you also on, on social media. But just could you please give us, a, in a nutshell, what are your offerings, your main courses and programs, how people can engage and work with you? And I can tell you one thing I don't know about other listeners. I know that my life has changed forever. <laughs> As a result of this conversation, I can just feel the shifts, not just in my thinking, but what that thinking has created. So thank you. And I really feel that, that this podcast alone, in addition to your obviously courses and programs and, and your teachings classes, can serve as a, as a transformational experience just by listening to it. So... Thank you. Please tell us in a nutshell about your courses and programs. So I, once I found out that I could hire from the heavens and it became very real to me that, that I had so much assistance for every aspect of my life. Then I said, okay, gang, I have questions about life because I was brought up in this church that had told me one story <laughs> 
And then I just kind of went through another 20 years of not believing any of it and poo-pooing it all. What's the real truth? I want to (laughs) know, like, who am I? How'd I get here? What's my soul? Does any of this matter at all? And so they said, okay, we're going to tell you. And, uh, but here's the deal. You can't read any books about it. You can't read any books because we want you to hear it from us. And so for the next three years, I journaled asking all sorts of questions of my higher guidance about the nature of life, the mystic questions, which uh, is why my, my website is called Creative Mystic. Because I wanted to know what this life is all about. And during that time, I read no books. I these This was all information coming directly. And this is why this conversation is a little bit different. Because I didn't get it from a book. <laughs> and after that was finished, then they told me that I threw the I Ching. And they said, it's time now for you to share with the world the spiritual insights you've been given. And so I began a program called the Creative Mystic Intuitive, and that is a three-month program where where we delve into the big issues of life, like what's your journey all about? What's your soul doing here? What's the core thought form for which your soul was born? And what do you? What's your experience all about? What's your journey about? Are you know how do you discover meaning? All of that is in that course. Plus, I teach hiring the heavens and I teach dowsing and um, and oracle reading in that course. Then there is an advanced three months where it's for higher guidance life coaching to teach people how to do it either for themselves or for others to tap into higher guidance and let higher guidance be the coach. And it's an extraordinary experience because it's unlike any life coaching. If you go with typical life coaching, there's a result that you want to get, right? Like, okay, you want to make X amount of dollars a year. Let's let's look at your program, see what we can do for marketing and get you to that place. And all of that is important, but you won't hear that kind of information from higher guidance. Higher guidance is going to give you a unique approach, but it's going to be exactly what your soul desires. And you will know it at a very deep level. You will have that sense of fulfillment and I, you will save yourself thousands of dollars and umpteen number of years by getting clued into what your journey is about so that you can participate from that awareness rather than just trying things uh, from, you know, you know, hit and miss. <laughs> so it's a path to fulfillment. Mm. Thank you. And again, uh, Jean, I am amazed <laughs> about yet another point of great similarity and an amazing similarity between our paths because I have been writing down my insights I have been receiving for the past several years, in fact, which I'm now putting together. And what is particularly interesting, I was given at the beginning of my journey the same message. Keep writing down and limit your exposure, limit the information you are getting from other sources, because we want to give you the original information so that it is not contaminated. Now, I have to say that the title Creative Mystic has a double meaning. You are a visual artist, and I absolutely love your paintings. At which point in your life did you pick up the brush? (laughs) Well, I'll this. My angels told me to do it. Ah, of course, <laughs> you know, five. Yes, they did. Five years ago, I was at um, a gathering that I do every year with a group of ladies. We usually take a whole week to commune with higher guidance, and on the very first night, I asked the ladies 
what do you what do you want to do to bring in more joy in your life? And everybody talked. And the last person to speak was me. And I hadn't pre-thought what I was going to say. And out of my mouth jumped the word diversify. That's all it said. And I go, diversify? What does that mean? Well, the next day, I thought, I'm going to find out a little bit more about what they meant by diversify to bring more joy into my life. And so I had I saw some oracle cards. I grabbed a deck. I shuffled them. I laid them out. I pulled a card out. What did the card say? Diversify. <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. And what my angels began to tell me is that I had uh, spent so much time developing my courses that, and so much time sitting at the computer that it's time now to take a complete break from development and go do something that has nothing to do with work, my quote unquote work. Mm -hmm. So that's when I began, I started playing pickleball, started going to Zumba classes and taking different art classes. And I uh, decided to get into painting again because I had painted before my kids were born and had given it up for almost 30 years. So I started painting again. And I'll tell you what, it's just been a joy. It truly has added more joy to my life. Mm. Thank you for sharing. And it shows. Yes, I would encourage people to um, visit uh, Jean's website. Do you have a separate website with your gallery or is it on the same one? It's on the same one under the tab Art for Sale. On the same. Okay. Well, time is catching up with us very, very, very quickly. My final question. Is there a magic bullet? If you could create one, and by magic bullet, I mean something that would, you know, a, a panacea that would solve all the problems somehow or improve our life. So that's why I call a magic bullet. If you could create one, what would it be? So one of the things that happens when I am working with clients is that they'll often say to me, I just want to have a life of ease. I want money to come to me with ease. I want health to come to me with ease. I want my relate I want my new mate to come to me. You know, they 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 want to attract it as in the in the law of attraction. They just want to have it attracted to them and be with ease. And it's so funny Anna because in, I hear their higher guidance say no you don't. Here's why. That would be like saying, I just want to get my PhD. I just want somebody to hand me the diploma. I don't want to have to go to school. I don't want to have to work for it. I just want it given to me. Really? It, when things are, you know, you really don't want that. So mm -hmm. when we are creators of experience, this is a coveted experience here that we are so excited to embark on. When we come to explore a certain thought form, we know that it's going to take everything we've got. And that's how we want it. We want to test ourselves. We want to know what we're made of. We want to know that we can do it. It's kind of like saying, I want to climb Mount Everest, but I, I'm never going to set foot on a mountain or, or practice or uh, you know, but I do want to climb Mount Everest. Well, if you really want to climb Mount Everest, you're going to have to start with some smaller mountains. You're going to have to, you know, get all the gear. You're going to have to, you know, really get in great shape. You're going to have to work for it. And you know that. And you know that when you accomplish that, you feel amazing. I did it. And that is exactly how our soul feels. We come in and we put a mm. challenge in front of us and we say, I know this is going to take everything I've got and I am up for that challenge and I know I can do it, you know, and I know it's going to take everything I've got and I'm ready for that. I can do it. And we challenge ourselves. So we don't want to sit back and say, well, I just want everything to come to us with ease. No, we don't. 
We want to see what we're made of. So we don't want to have a magic bullet. No. I'm loving it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm loving it. What would be your final thought? Would you like to to either as a summary or a final thought you would like to leave our audience with? My guidance is telling me to tell you this final story. Mm -hmm. And that is that my book was picked up. With the, you know, there's a whole story on, on how it got published by New World Library. Before it was published, I self-published and a person on the internet bought it. And he reached out to me and he said, you need to get this with a major publisher. Um, and I wrote back and it said, yes, it's been picked up by New World Library. That's the publisher of The Power of Now. And he says, fantastic. That was the publisher I was going to recommend. And I live not too far from here. And if you're ever in the area, you need to stop by. I have some things I'd like to share with you. Well, I filed that away in my mind. Six months goes by. And there's a conference given by the owner of New World Library, and I decide to go to it. And as I'm driving there, his name pops up in my head. Oh, yeah. He said, if I'm ever in the area, I should contact him. Well, too late now. And then I heard, you'll meet him when you need to. So I go to the conference. It's packed room. It's about 750 people there. And people are, stand, are lined around the outside because there aren't enough chairs. I'm up at the front third, about a third the way in, and there's one chair open to, next to me. And this guy is making his way down the aisle. And he says, is that seat open? And I looked up and I saw his name tag and he saw my name tag and it was the sky. So I knew there was a reason we were brought together. On the second day, I found out why. He told me, when your books come out from the publisher, I would love for you to give me a couple because I have two very good friends I'd like to give them to, Shirley MacLaine and Kevin Ryerson. Wow. Oh. So my books are hand-delivered. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm loving it. Okay. Jean, it's been such a pleasure to be speaking with you and this conversation has exceeded all my expectations, which doesn't happen very often, I might say. <laughs> and I have never gone so deep into rabbit holes and so far out on a limb before, even though I have been um, noted as being brave and out there. But this has exceeded all that I have, all my previous conversations. So I'm deeply grateful and thankful for your time and this conversation and how much you have shared with us. And as I said, I'd love to have you back at some point because there is so much more we can dive into. And as you can tell, there is no limit on this podcast. We can go as far and as, as deep as we want to. So thank you. Thank you so much. And I thank you for the opportunity because I don't have the chance to go there that often with podcasters. But but just from the title that you had for this, I knew right away, oh, we're going to go there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we did. <laughs> thank you so much, Jean, and all the best. And hopefully we will touch base and speak again. I appreciate you too. And I thank you for the opportunity to help get the message out. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me, and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.